So do we have this uh, presentation? No signal right now. <laughs> there we are. So uh, as I prepared this intervention, I thought a lot about how we would use, how we use the word accountability. It's been pointed out that there's no direct equivalent of this word in French, which is my mother tongue, in Italian or Spanish, in, in the Romance languages. We tend to use something closer to res responsibility, responsabilité, responsabilità. Uh, but it, responsibility speaks of one aspect of accountability, close to the, the adjective, you know, to be accountable, to be responsible. But when we say to be held accountable, you know, I'm holding you accountable, there's something else that is being added to the idea of being responsible. There's also the idea of being imputable for an action or a situation. And accountability goes further when we look at it as an attitude in life or as a virtue even. We could speak about the virtue of accountability. It implies taking true ownership for a situation and personally engaging with it in order to move forward towards a set goal. And so it's in consideration of this attitude that I want to answer the questions, what are the challenges of accountability for bishops? Or another way of asking the question, why do I find it difficult to develop the virtue of accountability in my life as a bishop, and particularly concerning the sexual abuse of minors by our clergy? Now, the first fact that I should acknowledge is that I do indeed find it difficult to acknowledge my responsibility in this area. As a young person, uh, as, as a young priest, when I first became aware of priests having abused young persons, it, it was through a, a newspaper article about a lawsuit that was launched against a diocese and I clearly remember asking myself, well, why are they suing the diocese? Somebody asked that question here. The priest is the one who abused. Why don't they sue the priest? What does the diocese have to do with this? When I became a bishop, I was faced with 15 similar lawsuits in the diocese where I was named. I told myself, my predecessors, they didn't know what those priests were doing. And I was frustrated that they, or my diocese, was being held responsible for the consequences of such acts that go against everything the church stands for. It took me a while to realize that my attitude could actually make it easier for a priest to abuse a young person in my diocese. That my refusal to, or my resistance to accept responsibility was opening the way to further acts. Obviously, I'm not responsible in the same way that the abusing priest is. However, I do have a share of responsibility which I must acknowledge and which should guide my own attitudes, my decisions, and my actions. And in that sense, I must rise to the challenge and embrace accountability as a positive stance, which will lessen the possibilities of abuse in the church. I recently read an article which outlines 16 traits of accountability in the business world. I found this article intriguing and challenging. These 16 traits were presented in a study published 30 years ago by three American authors, Roger Connors, Tom Smith, and Craig Hickman. The title of their book is The Oz Principle, Getting Results Through Individual and Organizational Accountability. 
They call it the Oz Principle because they use the story of the Wizard of Oz as a template to study the idea of accountability. Their approach provides an efficient structure as we seek to identify some of the challenges diocesan bishops face in developing an attitude of accountability. I'm indebted to them for their insights in helping me organize my thoughts and present them to you in a coherent fashion. Of these 16 traits, the first four deal with my ability to see the situation, to understand it from the inside, as it were, to grapple with its dimensions, its breadth, its meaning, and its impact in the lives of those immediately affected, but also in the life of the church and of our world. So to see the situation, I must learn to obtain the perspective of others, and especially of victims. It's not really easy for a bishop to obtain the perspective of others on this issue of sexual abuse. There aren't many occasions for me to hear their thoughts on this issue, so I need to create spaces for this to happen. And I must school myself in listening for example, I don't necessarily enjoy reading articles or watching documentaries about sexual abuse of minors in the church, but how will I understand the perspective of others if I don't discipline myself to do this? I must also create spaces for discussion on this issue where I am present and take time to listen, whether this be at a meeting of the priest's council or the diocesan pastoral council or during the pastoral visitation of the parishes of my diocese. This requires me to plan actively and to decide to make it one of my priorities. Secondly, I need to communicate openly and candidly. And to be honest, this is not a habit in our church. We tend to be circumspect. We want to save face, not embarrass anyone. We have trouble acknowledging that our predecessors did not handle these situations correctly, that they were misinformed, or that they were unprepared, untrained. We have difficulty recognizing our own shortcomings and asking forgiveness for not having been up to the challenge. We want to protect the reputation of the diocese or of the priesthood. And so we obfuscate and we shade the truth. We need to get over this. We, learn, we need to learn to speak with courage or parresia, as Pope Francis often reminds us. We need to believe that the truth will set us free. Third, we need to ask for and we need to offer feedback. I shared this in my small group uh, yesterday. I taught high school for five years as a young priest. It was a public school, so they didn't see me as a priest. They saw me as an employee, a teacher. And as a teacher, my work was regularly evaluated. I looked forward to the occasions where I would get feedback concerning my efforts. I appreciated the suggestions that were made to me to help me become a better teacher. Why is such regular evaluation not integrated into the life of the priest? We need to learn to ask others to tell us how we're doing, how we might improve particularly in the area of clergy sexual abuse. Many dioceses now have consultative committees in this area. Could we not ask them what they think of our efforts as bishops? What their expectations might be? What suggestions they might have for improving my ministry as a bishop? But I also need to learn to offer my own feedback in this area, particularly with my peers at the level of the Episcopal Conference and with the priests 
who need leadership from me. And finally, in order to see the situation, I need to hear and say the hard things in order to see reality. When we're speaking of the sexual abuse of minors, we're speaking with very hard things. To listen to a victim speak of their abuse and its consequences in their lives, to speak of our own sorrow and shame at what happened, to listen to survivors speak of how they were not believed or how their complaint was dismissed, to speak our apology, a true apology, for how they were treated. These are very hard things indeed. And yet we need to do them to face head on the reality of this scourge. Only at this price will things change. The next four traits deal with owning the situation, owning the issue. You know, we, you can see it, but you own it. This entails engaging it with it personally, seeing it part as, as part of my responsibility and focusing on it in a serious way. So first of all, I need to be personally invested. Now, why is this difficult? As bishops, we learn to delegate and to entrust to others the many issues that cross our desks daily. When it comes to sexual abuse of minors in Canada, we've been encouraged to name a diocesan delegate to receive and manage complaints. We've been asked to create consultative committees to discuss these issues. We've been told it's good to hire specialists to develop guidelines and implement them in our dot parishes. And all of this is excellent but it runs the risk of disengaging the bishop from the issue and of avoiding personal involvement. I need to keep myself informed, to accept to meet people and answer their questions, to participate in meetings, and to support those who are bearing the load. There's a lot to do as a bishop, I can tell you that, but this issue is crucial and it demands that I make of it a personal priority. To own the situation, I need to learn from both successes and failures. No doubt some people will ask, where are there successes in this issue? Well, I believe that helping justice move forward, fostering healing of victims and creating secure environments are all successes and I can build upon these as I study what worked and why, and I can learn even more from the successes of others, see how they are moving forward and follow their example. But I can also learn from their failures, from my own failures. To do this, I need to acknowledge them, to face them. This requires lucidity and humility I must pray the Spirit to give me such virtues and grace as I strive to put them into practice. I need to ensure that my work is aligned with key results. Recently, our diocesan coordinator for safe environments brought something to my attention. She pointed out that some of the objectives I had set in the decree establishing our diocesan polity, policies had been forgotten and that we needed to reflect in the, on them and see how we could attain them. She had gone back to the original vision, compared it to what we were doing with that vision. I thank God that she had the insight to do this, for it's important that we continually return to the key results we're striving for to evaluate our own work. This requires of bishops to make sure that those key results have been identified, well communicated. Part of accountability in an organization is ensuring that everyone feels engaged and commits themselves to attaining the key results that have been identified. That in itself can be a challenge, but it helps us to learn to be accountable. 
And fourthly, in order to own the situation, we need to act on the feedback we receive. It's one thing to be open to feedback, it's another to act on it. As parishioners, the public, children's advocates and survivors speak to us and share their insights, it behooves us not only to receive their advice, but to work with our teams in adjusting our policies and actions. It takes energy to listen to feedback, even more energy to act on it. Sometimes I get discouraged. However, I must remember that the people who are giving me that feedback are also investing a huge amount of energy as they reach out to me and share their insights and wisdom. The only way I can honor their engagement is by making sure that it bears fruit as I act on the feedback that I've received. Okay, so I see the situation, I've owned it. Well, now I have to work at solving it. What approaches can actually help to move the church forward? What can I do personally to contribute to the transformation that needs to occur? So, first of all, I constantly have to ask myself, what else can I do? That in itself is a challenge, you know, because we feel we're doing a lot and investing a lot. And, and to continually say, yes, but perhaps there's more I can do. It's pretty easy for me to compare myself to others and see that I'm doing pretty well and sit back and rest on my laurels. I must resist that temptation. I need to consider all the time and energy a bishop dedicates to making sure that money is well managed in his diocese and parishes. We spend a lot of time making sure money is well managed. That safeguards and auditing of finances are continually carried out, that experts are consulted and policies updated, that there's personnel to carry out these questions about money. Yet how much more important are the experiences of children as they set out on the journey of life? As a bishop, it seems I never shirk from the needs, what needs to be done around money issues. Shouldn't I be just as committed when it comes to caring for the weakest and the most vulnerable among us? And that's why I need to ask myself continually, what more can I do? What are the best practices arising? How can I integrate them into my ministry and my diocese? I must admit that this conference has been very tiring for me because I've been writing down continually, oh, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. Oh, here's something new. I've got such a work list to do when I go back home. <laughs> But I'm afraid too many dioceses and too many of our priests and our faithful think that the crisis is behind us. I believe this crisis will always be with us. Always. Because just like the, the poor, there will always be abusers among us. We cannot let down our vigilance. We must constantly seek to improve. I need to learn to collaborate across functional boundaries. In my small diocese, my diocesan staff were 10 people. That's all, just 10. There's the bishop's office, there's the pastoral services, there are administrative services, and the, the, the chancery, four offices. It's remarkable how despite our small size, we still managed to compartmentalize so that functional boundaries that are meant to make our work smoother become barriers to collaboration and true efficiency. 
Recently in the Archdiocese of Montreal, there was a study done by a judge, Judge Pepita Capriolo. She investigated a particular case which was mishandled. And among the various recommendations that she made, there was this one that a clear and well-defined flow of information be established laterally between the various departments and vertically from the employee to his superior or her superior and to the archbishop. She had found that the lack of collaboration across functional boundaries within the diocesan staff had contributed to the poor management of the case she was asked to study. As a bishop who oversees the overall administration of my diocese, it rests with me to make sure that all staff members and volunteers collaborate in a spirit of common purpose and vision to safeguard against sexual hand abuse and to handle complaints with care and with speed. Third, I need to learn to deal creatively with obstacles I remember once uh, hearing that a victim had expressed the desire to meet with me as the bishop, despite the fact that he had launched a lawsuit against the diocese, he wanted to speak with me. Our insurance company lawyers uh, who were handling the lawsuit were completely against such a meeting. But I knew something of the background of the story. I felt strongly that such a meeting would help the victim with reconciliation and with healing. So I spoke to our diocesan lawyer. He explained to me why the insurance companies were against this meeting, but he accepted to find a way for the meeting to happen that would satisfy them. Ultimately, the presence of a personal mediator the establishment of clear objectives and limits to our conversation allowed the meeting to happen to the clear satisfaction of the victim. I tell this story because we often face obstacles when dealing with the individual cases or when establishing diocesan-wide policies. We can't let these obstacles stop us from moving forward. I find discussing such issues with people outside my diocese often gives me new perspective, helps me imagine creative solutions. This also is part of growing in accountability. We need to take the necessary risks. Um, the first time I was confronted by TV cameras following a meeting dealing with sexual abuse, I was so scared, I bolted out the door and ran away locking myself into a room from which I couldn't exit. <laughs> My lawyer suggested I get some media training. <laughs> a few years later, I was asked to participate in a talk show on National Public TV Network to talk about the clergy sexual abuse issue. At first, I refused. I had seen the host of this program at work. I knew how he could be merciless in his questioning, especially when it came to a representative of the church. But our media consultant told me that if I didn't go, my chair would remain empty and the people around the table would be able to say anything they wanted without anybody to respond. And so I reluctantly accepted. I have rarely been as nervous as the evening I stepped onto the soundstage of that talk show. But my sister, told me to count on the presence of the Holy Spirit who abides in the hearts of people of goodwill and convinced me that the audience wanted to hear a message of hope and they would receive it warmly if I gave it. She told me to make a sign of the cross on the desk as I walked into my place for the interview. She told me to do the same thing this afternoon. <laughs> But you know, she was right. I allowed myself to be open and transparent, acknowledging our failures, but speaking of our efforts to right these wrongs. I ended the evening exhausted, but at peace. The host even invited me to join him and his staff for a beer at the local bar afterwards. Here was the time I took a risk 
and it paid off. Doesn't always, but that time it did. As a bishop, it's easier for me to stay in my comfort zone and not take such risks. However, I can't grow in accountability if I'm not willing to do so. I need to remember the Holy Spirit is with me and dare take the necessary steps for the sake of the children. Five minutes? Do I still have five minutes? Yeah. So the last four traits remind us that we need to do whatever needs to be done. So, act. The first thing is it's important that I do the things I say I'm going to do. I know that people's expectations on this issue are high, and in various situations I find myself promising to undertake a certain action in response to their demands. Sometimes I'll be interviewed by journalists, and in answering their questions, I'll commit myself to acting in a particular way. I've met survivors, and in conversation with, my, with them, promised to change a certain process or an approach in my diocese or in my personal response. I attend meetings of committees where I find myself saying, mm, I'll follow up on your recommendations. It's essential that I do it. As young people like to say, I must walk the talk. Research has shown that credibility is the single most important attribute of effective leadership. And nothing undermines credibility more than promising to act and not acting. So the challenge lies in facing the time and energy to enact my promises. I've got a lot of issues to deal with. My agenda is already full. I'm exhausted by the scope of Episcopal ministry. It's so easy to put off to tomorrow anything that isn't urgent, however important it might be. One helpful approach I've found is to empower one of my staff to constantly remind me of my commitments, one of our secretaries. It's her job. Bishop. Bishop, <laughs> and she feels bad when she says that. I said, thank you, thank you. And the other thing that helps is to bring these commitments to prayer so that I reflect on them in God's presence. It's harder to ignore them. <laughs> I need to stay above the line. The line here is the line between the virtue of accountability on top and the attitudes that keep me below the line, that I don't develop the virtue. Some of these attitudes might be waiting to see what happens, expecting others to tell me what to do, refusing to take responsibility, blaming others, blaming the culture, blaming media, ignoring the problem, denying it doesn't exist, seeking to seek my own reputation or career. I need to be constantly on guard against these attitudes and root them out as soon as they appear in my thoughts, my reactions, and my judgments. Staying above the line requires fortitude, insight, perseverance, and courage. I need to pray the Holy Spirit to impart these gifts to me and those I work with to help me truly develop accountability. I need to track progress with proactive and transparent reporting. Um, I need to give an account of my actions to stakeholders. We've identified four groups during this conference. Victims, children, the faithful, the broader public, behooves us to find ways of informing each of these groups about what we're doing, the programs we've implemented, the innovations we've undertaken. Most people in my country are unaware of this. Most of the members of the clergy don't know. We haven't truly engaged in reporting about our activities. And perhaps one of the problems is true communication involves dialogue. We simply can't issue a report and then refuse to answer questions about it. We need to find ways of receiving and responding to the reactions, whether they be positive or negative. We need to be open to the judgments of others, accept their praise, yes, but also be open to their complaints when they say it's not efficient enough, it's not thorough enough, it's not radical enough, it's not broad enough. Am I open to accepting those comments? These questions testify to the challenges I face in trying to grow in accountability. And the last is to build an environment of trust. I guess we can understand this as the goal that we're striving to achieve. The church can't fulfill its purpose of proclaiming the gospel and of gathering Christ's disciples and fellowship and prayer and sending them to continue Christ's mission in the world if it loses the trust of its members, particularly its most wounded and vulnerable. 
or the trust of the people of goodwill who look to us for guidance and example. The sexual abuse crisis has deeply hurt that bond of trust between bishops and priests, between laity and clergy, between believers and non-believers. Many inquiries into public opinion show that the Catholic Church is one of the least trusted organizations in North America. In spite of all the good we do in works of education, social welfare and development, healthcare and art outreach, we are not considered trustworthy. It's going to take a long time to rebuild that trust, probably a few generations. But it will only happen if we continue to make it a priority, if I, as a bishop, make it my priority. Developing an attitude of accountability will foster trust, and fostering trust will help me grow in accountability. So in conclusion, I just want to thank you. I've been a bishop for 26 years now, and I've been involved in this issue since my Episcopal ordination. But focusing on this topic of accountability has forced me to look at my own attitudes, making an examination of conscience, challenging me to develop attitudes, forcing me to take a serious look and my continued commitments and actions. So I thank God for this occasion. I thank you, the leaders of this conference, for having given me this task. And may my poor words help you to respond to the challenges of growing in accountability each in your own way. Thank you very much.